Welcome back to Being Everything Else. Everything about story and narrative and fiction and whatever, I don't know. We don't really have a good name for this one. Charismatic intro, as always. Yep, I'm doing that job. All right, let's get it done. <laughs> yes, today today we're talking about the, the fallacy of story uh, and the difference between story and, and narrative, for lack of, of better terminology, uh, in uh, tabletop role-playing games. So we, we just exited the theory-heavy section. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, fictional positioning, about what is and isn't story in a role-playing yeah. game, uh, and how to look at games in terms of whether they care more about the mechanism for generating fiction or the fiction for triggering mechanisms, and where games fall in those two uh, spaces. Uh, so what we want to do now is talk about specific examples, like stuff that you can do as a GM to make games that feel more like a story, uh, that, that are engaging and fun for you as a player, because we can't, we can't help you make it fun for the other players. That's their job. But we can help you have more fun. And for a lot of GMs, that means being a better GM, which is what we're trying to do for you here. Oh, yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about techniques, but we're also going to talk about games. What you want to do first, Steven? Uh, I think we should start with games, and then we can talk specifically about techniques that either come okay. from those games or can be applied to those games. That sounds like a good structure to me. How about you, Adam? Yeah, that's fine, Mamie. You're on board with this? All right. Super on board. I love talking about games. Yeah. So, like, uh, you know, what are some games that we can talk about that address story narrative fictional issues well and maybe not as well like what are some common challenges that games face in addressing these concerns i think that and and this is a point that i think somebody made in in chat way early on i bit stuck in my head um 8, eight bit deity mentioned that i think that the idea of having everything preordained and and story focused uh, I think that that comes from uh, TSR publishing adventures. Mm. I think that's that's where a lot of this stuff started. So if you want to look at a place where the idea that you have to have every goddamn thing planned out might have come from, that could be it, right? Because you're, you're spending your whatever, $5 back in 1977 on a copy of The Village of Hamlet, and hot damn, there is every piece of possible information you might need in there and that's what makes them so like adventure modules like such a thing because you know that tension that you have where you're like oh god i have to prep everything she hey look somebody did it for me mm -hmm. all right cool well you're in the keep on the borderlands and it says right here there's goblins so goblins there be yep you know so i, I think that that's if you're looking at constructed story prior to uh prior to play that's the closest you're gonna get, right? Is these these pre-built whatever, but you don't have to GM like that. Just just because a company makes products that way doesn't yep. mean that you at home need to map every room of the dungeon and figure out exactly where everybody is and like everybody's second cousin's amount of copper pieces in their pocket and if it's nine AM on a throngs day, where will Wilhelm be? Yeah. Like uh those things are very powerful sort of as um inspiration for how to do stuff because it's like okay i want to write an adventure for my players well huh i have no idea how to do this how are other adventures written let me look at the village of hamlet let me look at keep on the borderlands um oh shit i need to know all of this stuff yeah what not what, true what would what would happen if they were looking for wilhelm on throngs day and i yeah. didn't know where he was oh god i'm the worst gm I yep it. there you go because because people will People will ask you for stuff you don't know, and then because you didn't know it before the game started, there's no way you could know it now, and therefore they will not know where to find that guy. They'll stumble around, it'll be boring, it'll be bad, and it'll be your fault because you're the person in charge of the story. No, That's true. throw so all of go, that out. Go buy, go buy some published adventures. <laughs> This is the coast you owe us yeah. money. <laughs> Secretly, this is where Adam and I <laughs> reveal the truth behind, which is that we're just shelling for shilling yeah. for, for other companies. Yeah, yeah um, there are ways for you to deal with that situation uh, that some games do very well. Um, so, for example, 
Uh, one way that, that I always found incredibly useful, like when I found this tool, I was amazed because it completely revamped my GMing, is from Apocalypse World. Where they talk about fronts, where instead of, you know, here's literally what happens, and first A happens, and then B happens, and it sort of involves the player's actions, fronts look at your world, aside from the players, and ask, what would happen if the players weren't involved at all? And then it says, okay, like, you know, maybe uh, first the, uh, the, the water filtration unit breaks and then um, people start getting sick and then the mayor hires a cleaning crew. The cleaning crew doesn't come back because the giant octopus monster erupts from the, you know, filtration unit and starts rampaging about town. And then it sort of gives you space to put, like, the ending sort of circumstances where it's like, okay, because the giant octopus monster rampaged about town, there's anarchy, you know, these factions split off, you know, there's an apocalypse, you know, an octopus apocalypse guy sitting here now, whatever. <laughs> that's okay, that's that's my new name. I'm going to make an entire game just called... <laughs> the octopus, Apocalypse... Oct- octopus Apocalypse Guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's going to be cool. It's going to be a mashup of Octodad and Apocalypse World. It's going to be beautiful. Uh, I think that would sell really well. <laughs> so, like, um, fronts give you, as the game master, a tool that helps you understand the, the, the narrative pieces of your story in a way that lets you use them flexibly in play in such a way that when your players mess with them, they can mess back and you sort of understand the ways in which they like to mess with stuff. And and you can think about fronts as a countdown from bad to worse. Um, mm-hmm. And at any point, once something bad happens, all the points below it on the on the countdown are still negotiable, right? So... Like let's let's say we make a we make a front for our game and it's like where's Wilhelm, and the first thing in the front is nobody knows where Wilhelm is, and then the next one is uh, Wilhelm wanders out into the woods, and then Wilhelm falls down the magic well, and then Wilhelm gets cursed by the demon at the bottom of the well, and Wilhelm comes back to town and kills everyone for not going looking for him soon enough, right? Yep. Now. If you, if you come in at the beginning, you're going to get basic adventure starter stuff, right? You're going to be like, where did Wilhelm go? Quince Wilhelm, right? People are looking for him, and they're like, mayhaps a good PC. I could give thee these silver pieces so you could go find my brother Wilhelm. And then, yep. cool, it's like a quest for Wilhelm. But if you cut in, cut in later on, and we were talking about this before, you cut in later on, it's like, what is yon rumbling in the woods? It's not about Wilhelm anymore. It's about, well, somebody fell down the magic well and things are going crazy. And what I like about uh, fronts as a system is they can be as big or as small as you want and they can be nested together, right? We, mm. we do this explicitly in Dungeon World where it's like your campaign front contains adventure fronts and the adventure fronts are just like several smaller things. Um, so maybe Wil- maybe Wilhelm falling down the well isn't your entire campaign. Maybe the campaign is about the great old ones that live under the village, and Wilhelm just happens to stumble upon one of them by falling down the well. Yep. Um, and again, you can you can negotiate from there out, right? If you find Wilhelm, maybe that's the end of the front. Maybe he never fell in the wood in the the well of the woods, and you're fine. Cool. That front done. Chuck it. Let's move on to the orcs, right? But maybe finding him causes some other bad thing to happen, right? And so you can look at these as nested series of, like we talked about at the beginning of the the last bit, if-then statements, right? Like, if you Mm -hmm. find Wilhelm at stage two, then this other front changes or some other thing happens. Like, that's perhaps the the most useful thing for me that comes out of fronts is that they tell me what's happening in the world regardless of what my players are doing because I don't know what my players are doing, but here's a sandbox for them to play in with all sorts of toys they can smash together. So, you know, stage one, where's Wilhelm? Oh, perhaps good PCs. Couldst we pay thou some silvers for searching our brother Wilhelm? No. Yeah, of course, they're PCs. They're like, fuck is to thee. Right, yeah. Like, no, we're going to go hunt bears in the woods. Okay, you go hunt bears in the woods for a week. You come back and everybody's acting a little weird because you didn't go find Wilhelm. Like, it it doesn't say, well, shit, there's nothing in my prep for when players don't do that because first players hunt for Wilhelm, players go to the well, players go down in the well, players do the well dungeon, players find the great old one at the end of the well. Like, that's what was supposed to happen. Nope. Fronts say... 
you know, here, here's all this stuff that you can do what you want with it, but if players don't, your preparation still counts. Well, your yeah, preparation I, still helps you. Honestly, honestly, this is this is the best kind of lonely fun because you get to just be like, tee hee hee, what will happen next? Yes. Oh, and then he falls in the well. Oh, and then there's a demon. And that, that story still happens in your head. And cool, if the players go off... So this is the thing. If I make a story and it's the only story I've got and the players flip me the bird and go off and do something else, well, all my work is gone, right? But if I use fronts or, or a system of like ongoing problems for the world, then I'm going to uh, I'm gonna end up in a situation where, okay, cool. We're going to in play focus on the bear stuff. You're going on the bear hunt. Cool. I've got a front for that, right? Hunting young bears. But I don't lose the Wilhelm story because it's still happening, right? It's still going on in play. And in a lot of ways, you can, because of the way that the Dungeon World and Apocalypse World and games that use fronts are structured, you can literally check a box on a front as a result of some other non-related action, right? A GM mm -hmm. move in those games is like, um, you know, show danger on the horizon, so I could say, okay, well, you know, you guys are trying to negotiate with the villagers, and the villagers are like, we will give thee five pieces of silver to find Wilhelm. And you're like, nay, good sirrah, I will take no less than 12. And you fail your, your persuasion roll. I can be like, cool, you hear a terrible scream from the woods. Mm-hmm. Yep. The villagers are too afraid to deal with you now. Something has gone wrong, right? And so once you've heard Wilhelm scream in the woods... Maybe you'll go check it out, or maybe you'll be like, forget these villagers, fuck us to this whole situation. <laughs> fuck us to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to go hunt some bears. Right? Yeah. But as a GM, you're, you're framing things up, and uh, this, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again, fronts are the most portable technology in Apocalypse World, and you can put them in any game you want. I run yep. Swan Song using fronts. Like, I, I have, I have a... a well, they're all really spoilery, and I don't want to tell Steven any of them, but I have fronts. Pretty much, if you think about the game, <laughs> and you look at basically any kind of, of thing that's happening in the game, I've either got a long or a short front for that stuff. And honestly, like the Endoni situation, that front I wrote up day one, after my first GM turn, but I've been modifying the details of it as we go. I've so got, that's, that's a thing. Uh, I, I, had, I used fronts in Dark Heresy. I had fronts. I have fronts for um, for the West Marches, which like that's maybe a little bit of a strange spot to put them in because uh, fronts are very player facing when they're used best. I feel, uh, and when they happen sort of out of the players even knowing that the front exists, then it's it's a little bit different. Yeah. Well, like, and honestly, honestly, like I, I think West Marches is a great place for fronts because mm -hmm. so fronts are named after. Like they're 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 called that funny name because it's about fighting a war on several fronts, right? Yep. As a PC in a role playing game, you are constantly beset by GM bullshit, right? You're like, look, all I want to do is get some fucking gold and buy a magic sword and be the best paladin in town, but you keep throwing shit at me. Like, there's an orc tribe in the hills. Oh, oh, but hold on, there's also an evil cult in the woods. Fine. Okay, let's deal with that. Oh wait, no, there's a demon. It's it's attacking the church. Great. And so you're juggling all these things. And so fronts allow you in a sandbox game to say, these are the things happening in the world. Pick the one you want to address, and I'm just gonna slowly nudge the rest of them forward while you ignore yep. them. Right? Yep. Like I mean, I know I see you doing this in West Marches, right? And I think the audience is starting to see it now too, when yep. stuff is paying off. Yep. Well, like uh, the whole thing with Mira in the last session, it's like that started in the very first session, but all along the way, like we've seen stuff sort of popping up where people are like, oh, you know, there's a group of hunters that say all sorts of animals are getting sick down the south of the Barrows. Honestly, yeah. man, that, that feeling is my favorite thing about GMing because it's not like, yeah, okay, if you if you funnel your players down the roller coaster and they finally get to the end and they're all like, wee, that was a fun roller coaster. Thanks for railroading us through that. You can be like, yeah, my prep was worth it. You're welcome. But you can have that feeling of glee and delight the whole game when you're like, oh, you don't want to go find Wilhelm, eh? <laughs> Check. <laughs> yeah, like it's it's so much fun to be able to manage that stuff, and really, like for me, the fronts are all about 
like tracking that and organizing that stuff. A lot of people do this without having a, like a dedicated system for it, but I find having sheets to keep track of that stuff on and having a, a sort of mechanism for the GM to walk through that, super Very, solid. very useful. So yeah. what's another game that has really good, helpful stuff for uh, dealing well with fiction, narrative, whatever? So one problem that I find that comes up a lot in role-playing games is like RPGs do this thing where they, because they want to be all open-ended and be like, yeah, you can you can do whatever you want, and there's all these details and stuff. They they screw you over by being like, okay, cool, you have to detail every moment of every day forever, right? Where you're like, and then this happens, and then this happens. Yep. And, and yep. What do you do now? Oh, you go for dinner. Okay. What do you do after dinner? And this what do you is do actually after dessert. This is something that I don't like about the West Marches. How like traveling, even though it's an important part of the game. How it's like, okay. You travel for four hours, okay, you travel for four more hours, okay, you camp, okay, you travel for another four hours, okay, you travel for four more hours. I would love to have another tool that's more like, okay, let's mechanically determine whether or not something happens on your journey. And if something does happen on your journey, let's just see that spot. Let's just find out that. And then the rest of it, it's like, yeah, you walk through some flowers and there's like a rain shower on your way and like you hide under a tree, like whatever, who fucking cares? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's, and that's that dis description, like how much to describe, how little to describe, when to cut, when not, games do not help you with that for the most part at all. They're just yep. like, here's systems, create a world and do world stuff because, you know, they're trying to be open-ended. They're trying not to tell you what to do. So a game that does that super explicitly is Fiasco, right? Where it's yep. like, the game is broken down into two acts. There's a thing in the middle. Each act is made up of scenes. Scenes are this. There is someone in the game at the table who gets to say, scene's over. We're done. I'm over this. We're, we're finished. Moving on. So from a perspective of managing moment to moment, like how long to stick with a thing, playing Fiasco is pretty much the, the best place you can start because it's structured specifically like a movie, right? Where it's like, do this thing, play it in these ways. It's structured in scenes, just like a movie is. you all seen movies. If you haven't seen movies, I don't know. Get out of the house. Go watch Blade Runner and then come back. Yeah. Um, you know, and so so it's like, you can you can look at a game as a GM, and I, I, I firmly believe that if the rules don't, I mean, I think the rules are the game, but as a GM, from a practical perspective, I believe that if the rules don't expressly say, these are how to manage when a scene starts and ends, that's the GM's responsibility. Like, I take it on myself to be like, everybody, maybe this is getting a little wrung out. Maybe we don't need to debate this anymore or discuss this. Let's jump to this next thing. Yeah, like, uh, it's interesting that, like, um players often don't necessarily know very easily when the scene is sort of resolved from the perspective of what they can possibly get out of it. So like it, it oftentimes does fall on like me as the GM or Adam as the GM or you as the GM to say like, okay, you know, like you want to keep throwing your dice rolls at this situation, but like you've failed enough or like you've succeeded enough that like the, the outcome is basically set. We don't really have to have another person come in the door right now and try more dice rolls. Like, okay, let's move on. Let's see what the outcome yeah. is from the the attempts that you've made. Well, my 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 thought is that some games do this well, and and some games do, don't do it at all. But there aren't any games that try to do it that I've ever played that try to do it and do it badly because mm. people don't think about it a lot when they're writing games. But like, I feel like if we had this this would be the time where we need like a little burning wheel emote. Like every time Adam solves a problem with burning wheel, we just spam the chat, the little fiery wheel. Yep. So there's a rule in burning wheel called let it ride, where you only ever get to roll for something once. Mm. Succeed or fail, that's it, right? Like I'm a thief. I'm a master thief. I'm great at getting into places and getting out. I say to you, I'm going to sneak in. We're going to have a scene of me sneaking in to my uh, rival's hideout and planting some evidence, right? So I'm going to say, cool, all right, that's my intent. Sneak in, plant the evidence. You're going to say, okay, make a stealth roll. I'm going to make the roll. If I get it, I sneak in, I plant the evidence, and I get out because that was my intent, and that's it. We're done, right? You don't get to be like, okay, make a stealth roll. All right, you're at the front door. Make another stealth roll. Okay, you're in his bedroom. Make another stealth roll. Just waiting for me to lose. Yeah. 
it's it's about uh, setting up the scene, rolling, and then just being done with it, right? Being like, fine, we are finished with this scene. And once you get like the advanced level of this scene framing stuff, oh, hot damn, you can do some fun stuff. You can be like, okay, you failed your stealth roll. It's six months later. You're in prison, right? Like you can you can jump forward, you can jump back, you can do all kinds of crazy scene framing tricks, but the game needs to help teach you how to, to do that stuff. Mm. Um, and it, I mean, it doesn't, like, most games don't do that. So Fiasco, great place to start. Uh, elements of it in Burning Wheel. Torchbearer does scene pacing really well, mechanically. Yeah. Um, I don't know, do you have any, any games that do that that you like? Well, like, you know, it's maybe worth mentioning that our, you know, the world's favorite role-playing game, Dungeons & Dragons, just, like, doesn't deal with any of this stuff at all. So, you know, you kind of have to get it from somewhere else. Um, let me think, like, of the games that I've played, Dark Heresy doesn't really have it, Pendragon doesn't really have it. Um, yeah. Like, interestingly, like, um, Pendragon's an interesting case because the way to play Pendragon is to play through the Great Pendragon campaign. And in the Great Pendragon campaign, it's super railroady. Um, and it basically says, okay, you know, like your players will be involved in this scene and this scene and this scene. So it kind of like, because it's a campaign that's pre-made and it's very sort of expectating, expecting what your players will involve themselves in, it sets up these sort of circumstances where your players have the ability to manipulate what's going on or not. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't do that mechanistically. It does that fictionally. Right. Um, and yeah. there is a difference. Yeah, and, and I don't, I haven't, I haven't like read the GM stuff for Pendragon, so maybe there's some advice in there to be like, move things along at this pace. But um, I feel like, you know, that's that's just it's just a, a neglected space, which is funny because the whole '90s was about like games that are supposed to be like stories and things are divided into acts and scenes. But like even Vampire, like Grand God King of like we're storytellers and this is a story. I don't think it ever says this is when you stop a scene and move on to the next thing. I love games that have like, like look at Night Witches. Night Witches has that thing where when you advance, you can be like, fuck this, I'm the GM now, this is boring, we're going to move on to the next mission and I'm in charge. GM, yep. make a character. I love nice. that stuff. Things that like shift or shuffle the, the structure of the game is they're really cool to be able to say like we're going to do a different thing now because I'm bored with this and instead of taking a plus one to my strength I'm going to steal the GM hat from you and now it's my turn you know it's really cool and and I think that more games are starting to do that and, and this is a given I think that the smaller like indie press stuff tends to be more experimental and takes bigger risks with these kinds of things um, but it's it's not a new concept by any means. Like Dogs in the Vineyard talks about GMs jumping days ahead on a fail or a success. Nice. Yep. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, you've decided you're going to run a game. Maybe you're running Dungeons and Dragons, but you want to like bring all of these elements in. You want to use fronts. You want to be aggressive about framing scenes and like pushing things forwards. Like, what are some other tools that you can use to help keep all of that stuff straight in your mind? How can you keep track of what you said? Like, fronts are a great way, and, like, listing them on a sheet of paper or having one page per front is very helpful. Um, I also, for, for, um, uh, for Dark Heresy specifically, I had one index card per NPC that was important in some way, sort of involved in a front, and I would write down on that index card name, gender, age, short description of what they looked like, uh, and then, like, specifically, um, their relationship with other PCs or NPCs. Like, if they had started getting annoyed by Jax Romulus, I'd just write down, you know, irritated by Jax. If they had started falling in love with another NPC, I'd say, you know, falling in love with so-and-so, yeah. Um, and then... Anytime I had a scene involving those NPCs, I'd flip through my note cards, find the ones that were relevant, and just have them out in front of me, just so I could be like, okay, here's what's going on. Oh yeah, motivation also, like, what what's this person's end game, what they want to have happen? I'd put that on the card too. And then it's just right there, and you have it really convenient in, at your hands. 
Um, I know that early on when, when you joined Roleplay, Adam, you uh, tweeted out a couple pictures of like flowcharts that you were using for tracking relationships between NPCs. You want to tell us about that? Oh my god, yeah. So uh, I think about this time, uh, a little later last year, I had just started a game of Sagas of the Icelanders, which is a game that's all about interconnection between characters, right? It's about a community and how they're connected. And, because it's old Norse society, it's like who owes who what and who has grudges with whom and like where all that stuff comes from. And like I can't keep track of that stuff with just a list or in my head. Yeah. And yeah. Um, what I do is I, I use a program called uh, OmniGraphle, but you can use any kind of like flowcharting software uh, to do this. I, I only, I only, yeah, I only use it because I don't have Vizio and I do not know how to make InDesign or or Illustrator do these things. Um, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll take, I'll start in the middle and say, okay, here are the PCs. And then I'll add all the PCs, the NPCs that are connected to them. And then how they're connected to each other and how they're connected to the other PCs and start to build out. So what started as a map that was like, you know, just like a little like, here's all my NPCs, here my PCs and like, you know, their brother and sister and mom and dad or whatever. But then there's like their uncle and then there's the weird guy that came to town and how they feel about them. And then this guy's dead now. So this guy hates this other guy. And I'll try to find the last map that I did of it. It ended up like I couldn't, I couldn't print it on a single piece of paper. I had to like scroll around it was like three feet by four feet worth of just like spider webs and like craziness and it's so useful because you can look at any given moment in the game at a specific npc and be like oh this npc feels this way about that character that way about this character and every line that you draw is a moment of tension or a moment of um of interest between two characters right where it's like okay today we're going to talk about how uh hrothgar and Sigrid have this like secret love child and like what that's about and like what happens if Ulf finds out because Ulf is in love with Sigrid. Will there be a fight? Like what's going to happen? Because tension isn't about what what is definitely going to happen. It's like how the hell is this going to turn out? Like what do we need to know before we go into that moment to, to find that out? So for yeah. me, like relationship maps... They're, they're an agnostic technology that I use for every single game that I play, basically. Unless the yep. characters don't give a shit about each other. And you can use them for characters with each other. You can use it with characters and how they relate to factions. I have a flowchart for all the factions in Swan Song and how they relate to each other. Uh, it's all really interesting. Um, like, the great thing about that is it starts letting you, like, it gives you more information at your fingertips. And mm. it gives you more complex information at your fingertips. Like, uh... <laughs> One of the best ways to use it is to recognize all of a sudden that, like, hey, I've got these two characters. I can have this character feeling one way about that character and this character feeling a different way about that character. And then you've got, like, two arrows and each of them, one of them says love, one of them says hate, whatever, awesome. Like, it puts it all right in front of you so that you don't have to be like, oh, God, like... Who was House Phaedrus and what do they care about again? Like, nope, it's all right there. You just, you've got it laid yeah, out. at your fingertips. I really like, uh, I like these. Um, so Apocalypse World has some advice for creating PC, NPC, PC triangles mm. that create tension in play. Because if you ever want to play a game that, uh, that does, like, PvP really well, Apocalypse World specifically, super good at it. Sagas, all about that stuff. Monster mm -hmm. Hearts, same deal. You don't even need you fucking you don't even need NPCs in Monster Hearts. It's a GM. You can just be like pulling their strings and pushing them to each other. Yep. But what you can do is place an NPC directly between two PCs and be like, all right, so here's Dremer, and Dremer happens to be the brother of uh, Hope, and so Hope and Dremer get along. They're great, but uh, Iris, the Brainer. You're a PC. You you hate Dremer, right? Like Dremer did something bad to you in the in the past. So now the players are in conflict over the NPC, and it's so much easier to track that stuff just by throwing it all onto a map and drawing lines between everybody. Yep, definitely. Yeah. Um, any other awesome tools that you know about? Like you know, we're just trying to show you how, like, as you as you let go of the plot that you thought you were gonna have happen and you start opening your mind to the possibilities of what could happen, we're just trying to show you that like, that doesn't have to be this scary, overwhelming thing and that there is technology, so to speak, that you can use to help keep that super manageable for yourself. Like, is there anything else we want to address before we go to Q&A, Adam? 
I mean, as far as tools go, like, I oh, think you can, so I think you can use, you can use the relationship map to track things that are not just relationships. Like, you can use it to track dungeons, too. Yep. Do you wanna, I mean, you, this was your point. Do you want to talk about this a little yeah, bit? Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good one. Like, flow charts are really convenient for tracking not just, like, relationships between characters, but, like, adventures and dungeons. So you could be like, yeah. okay, you know, I have, I have the, the foyer, and it's connected to, you know, the torture chamber. But then also there is a one-way exit from the torture chamber that goes through a secret entrance that comes out behind the fireplace in the foyer. So, like, there's all these sorts of relationships. And, like, what happens on the way from the foyer to the torture chamber? Maybe it doesn't really matter. And, like, uh, one of the things you can do in Dungeon World is allow players to discover new connections between things based on the way that they interact. Like... Uh, triggering moves in order to like manipulate the map almost. Um, well, I think think about it this way: if 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 something happens in a location, let's say you're flow charting a dungeon. If something happens in a location, it's a point. If nothing happens, just draw a line. Yep. <laughs> right. Yep. Like it's just tr it's just transit, right? So the the there's so many old D and D adventures where it's like. There's a bunch of hallways, and you walk around in them, and they just waste your time. And sure, if you want to, you can say, this is a two-turn long hallway, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't I don't even draw dungeon maps except just for kicks now. Like, if I'm making a dungeon, it's like, here's a square. In this square, I'm going to describe what's in the room. Maybe I'll just put a big-ass question mark, because I don't know. I don't care. We'll figure it out later. So there's there's ways to track things that are not maybe the way you would think about them because a dungeon is just I'm moving from area A to area B by way of area F and you can get to F through C or D and building up that flowchart so yeah um, and then like the the extra twist you can do in your mind is that these flowcharts are really convenient for like interacting with NPCs like if you're if you have a murder mystery set at the ball and like the doors get locked and someone gets murdered when the lights turn out and then all the chandeliers catch a flame again and someone's dead and everybody's wondering what happened like okay you've got NPC you know a you've got the mayor you've got the urchin and you've got you know the 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 scarlet woman or whatever and like each of them have different information depending on when you go to them, and each of them can give you different information about the others, and you can draw all this out on a flowchart, and it's like, okay, if first players approach the Scarlet Woman, then she implicates, you know, the mayor. But if players first approach the yeah, dude, urchin, it's, it's then all, he'll tell them if, that they weren't ever together. Like It's all if-then statements, right? Like, yep. if this, when this happens, then that, et cetera, et cetera. Node-based scenario design. It's all jaquaying your plot, not just yeah. your dungeon. Yeah, right? jaquaying, jaquaying. So, like, we uh, we mentioned this a little while back. Uh, uh, Janelle Jaquay, is that her name? Mm -hmm. Is the S pronounced? I, I don't know. Anyway, um... Let's not spend 45 minutes on it like Debating the S. Like, uh, she was a, a big proponent of developing dungeons that you can enter in multiple points and where the levels of the dungeon have multiple mm. connections between I found, them. I found an awesome example of this recently in a computer role-playing game. So yeah. um, the big mega dungeon in Pillars of Eternity is super jaquade. You can go from level 1 to level 5. Like, I went in, went down the blood tunnel, ended up in level 5, and then spiraled my way back up to level one before I went back down to six. Mm. And you can do that, not just, like, dungeons Dungeons are just a constrained set of narrative influences. You can do that kind of stuff with, like, everything. You can do it with, with character motivation. It can be like, look, if you want to off the Ural, the best way to kill Ural, whatever, is to hit him in the face with an axe. That's the direct route. That's the, like, we go in the dungeon, we go straight to the bottom, and we kill the dragon. Yep. But if you want to get after the Jarl, you can work your way around by going after his court, and you can do all of that stuff, and that's that's going the slow way, right? And there's there's lots of ways to uh, to work your way through uh, a situation, right? Because again, everything in role playing is a combination of situation, setting, and character, and you can track all of that stuff using flowcharts, which I think you should do because I love flowcharts. One of, one of the things that always impressed me from the very beginning about Dungeons & Dragons is that you can have a dungeon where, like, the, the boss of the dungeon, the most powerful, most climactic encounter, is, like, in the first room or is in a room that the players may never run into. Like, there's this, this sort of infinite 
possibility space where the players can do anything and they can have a run of the dungeon that's super clean or they can have a run of the dungeon that's super messy. And you can do that with any kind of situation as well. So well, it's, all about, we... it's all about choice, right? It's about saying, mm -hmm. like, if you think you're tough enough, just just barrel straight through. Just go ham on the dungeon and go right to the boss and fight him right now, tough guy. Yep. yep. But the safe way would be to clear out all of the little bad guys so you don't attract their attention while you're fighting the boss. But it's still an option, right? It's, it's choices. Yep, absolutely. Um, so is it maybe time to move to Q&A? Yeah, let's, let's A some Qs. So, chat, if you have questions about narrative structure, story structure, like fiction in, in tabletop role-playing games, drop them in chat. We'll answer as many as we can. If we don't get to yours, of course, we're very sorry. But, uh, you know, whatever you would like to know about our topic for the evening, we would love to just riff with you for another 10, 15 minutes. Word. Mm. While we're so waiting I, for them to roll in, you've got a couple you've Yeah, I, gra I grabbed a couple that were from uh, from earlier on. Um, let's take a look at those, and we'll we'll copy some through. Um, mm -hmm. I was like that we just we just end up grabbing the same questions. <laughs> All right, I'll I'll start. You grab some questions, and we'll switch. Yep. Back. Questions. So half wing, uh, half wing scene. Remember the mask squad. What's up, half wing? Um, in Dungeon World, how do you reconcile the desire to reward your PCs for their play by giving them roles to fail on, but not take away their ability to use fictional positioning to accomplish tasks? So what I think Halfwing is asking me is, uh, and, and you, Stephen, as well, because you've played Dungeon World, um, is mechanically re-reward people for making and failing roles. We're rewarding them for risking uh, the chance that they might fail. But how do we how do we balance the fact that if you use fictional positioning to just never bother rolling, you know, how do we balance that they don't get XP for taking that risk? And and I think that in my mind, the the answer is in, inherent in the question that success is a form of reward, right? Not having to make the roll and having the GM just give you what you wanted to get, that's a that's a form of being rewarded, right? Success in character is a, is a reward too. So it, it tends to balance itself out. We see, I see XP in Dungeon World less as about like, good job, you, you failed a roll, and more like, I'm sorry, you're about to get screwed. Here's a point of experience. Um, you know, that's why we have other ways to get XP in the, in the game that are easier for the players to, uh, to kind of drive after. Cool. So let's see, I'm just going to drop this down into the answered questions section. Okay, so yeah. Um, next question, I guess. Like, uh, let me see. I have this really interesting one that I want to talk about from OMG Bad Beats LOL. And um, we're, we're like copy-pasting questions from chat so that we have a record. So if you've asked your question, um, try not to spam it. Yeah, because we, we are it. we are copy pasting. But um, OMG Bad Beats Law asks, curious to what Stephen thinks about the Great Pendragon campaign, which I talked a little bit about earlier. While it's constricted to the Arthurian myth, there are various results from the railroaded path to the Mad Saxon jumping out the window. And I think this is a very interesting question because uh, I do think that um, when you approach the game from a narrative perspective, you can get a lot more out of the Great Pendragon campaign than just those scenes that's elucidated in, in the rulebook. Like, um, uh, all of the sort of fairy stuff that happened with uh, Maggie's character, the Mad Saxon and the, the battle between Neil's character and the, and the rival family, like none of that was in the Great Pendragon campaign book, but uh, paying attention to the characters that Neil was interacting with, the situations that he found himself in, and the choices that he was making and the, and the roles that, that he uh, sort of came out with, it was very easy for me to transition away from sort of what the the, the pre-established uh, plot said was important and towards what my players determined was important for themselves. So, yeah, like um, using these tools will help you do this on your own, where maybe you have a story pre-planned, but your players start caring more about other things and you're just as able to bring those in and make them matter. I thought I thought it was so strange that you uh, you guys chose to play Pendragon on R and D and not on a longer campaign because, like the Pendra the Great Pendragon campaign, even if you do one year a session, will take you like a year and a half, two years yep. just to get through. Yep, it's so long. It's super I, long. I mean, the reason I did it is because it was a really interesting and really different system for building characters and playing with characters. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mm -hmm. wanted to show it off. 
But yes, like there are definitely elements of Pendragon that just don't come out over a short time. Like yeah. Pendragon is a is a dynastic game. It's a game It's a real slow burn. It's explicitly about building your manor, building your dynasty of of your your house's history and then seeing what happens as a result of like your grandfather's choices to, you know, 3 decades ago or whatever that you yeah. played. Yeah. So What's the next question we want to address. Got a, yeah, I've got a question here I grabbed from uh Quingali, Quingali, uh, having well fleshed out NPCs, give them giving them needs, aspirations, likes, dislikes is pretty important. Uh, I think that's a question. Uh, that way you can easily determine how they react to different things. Question mark. I grab this one because I think that often GMs will just like trying to over prepare a plot. You'll try to over prepare NPCs, and when it really boils down to it, and I, I think I've I've talked about this before. Uh, Jared Sorensen's game Octane basically says never describe any character in more than three things. If it takes you more than three things to describe your character, most of them don't matter, right? Don't tell me your hair color, don't tell me your eye color, I'm just gonna envision what your character looks like based on my own stuff anyway. So just pick three things that matter uh, about those characters. And for NPCs, the things that I think about are how do they relate to the other characters? How do they relate to the PCs and NPCs, right? Like, what is important about the way they feel about those characters, because that's gonna motivate them. Uh, what do they want, right? Like, how are these NPCs uh, driven, right? Like, if I, let's say, okay, uh, I like I like Higgs, I'm kind of, like, uncertain about Prosper, Mr. Sicarian scares me, and Piani is a weirdo nerd, that's going to color how I get at the thing that I want, which is to be a, an accepted member of the crew. Now, the last thing, the, the, the third thing that I always think about is uh, what tools do I have to accomplish that? So in this case, the tools that I have are my mechanic skills and my good nature. So that's how I get in with those characters. It's how I interact with the game. And once you understand those three things, you can pretty much pin down any NPC. It doesn't matter how much more stuff you want to tack on. Players will forget. Players don't tend to listen to more than a couple of sentences of stuff. So just express what's important in the moment. Oh, yep. There you go. Uh, here's a great a great sort of tack on question to that. By Design Zero One just asked Stephen Adam, when a new GM doesn't have the personal experiences to make NPCs or situations relatable to players, can tropes get them there, or is there a better method to understand how people or situations commonly play out? And I feel like this ties in directly to what Adam just said, which is that like really you don't need to know a whole lot about your situations, about your NPCs. You just need to know a couple high value things like where you want to go, what tools you have for getting there, your relationships with other characters, you know, knowing those things and and all of a sudden you have a lot. Like obviously being familiar with tropes, being familiar with dramatic situations, being familiar with stories will all help you do it easier, but you will surprise yourself with how little you need to know to do it quickly. Honestly, pick a trope and then find a way to invert it, right? Like Tropes, tropes are okay if you are still presenting human beings as a part of the trope, or yeah. elf beings, or dwarf beings, or whatever, mutant beings. You don't want to be like, this guy, okay, you see a paladin, and he's white, and he's blonde, and he's six feet tall, and he's muscly, and he's got silver armor, and he's so lawful good. And you're like, great, awesome. But if you're like, you see a paladin, and like, he's not what you expect. He's an orc, or he's an ogre. Or uh, he's kind of a complete dick, and despite being part of the Paladin Order, he's like kicking an old woman, right? And we talked about this in an earlier episode. Um, describe a character as like this, but this. So he's a Paladin, but he seems to be a complete douche nozzle. And then players will be like, whoa, Paladin douche nozzle? That's What's going on? What's up with that? Why is he kicking that old lady? Yeah. That's it. Uh, let's see. What are some other good good ones? Um, damn, and we've got some great questions. I want to talk about Terakai, who's asked, uh, since a lot of world advancement is lonely fun, uh, how do you help build that trust between DM and players to make them believe that the world advances impartially rather than how you, the DM, want it to? And this is an interesting question, because, like, on the one hand, there's nothing wrong with the world advancing how you want it to, as long as you're giving players the full benefit of their successes and their failures. Like, you know, if they had the opportunity to go and deal with, you know, the demon in the mine shaft, 
and then they didn't, and the mine melted into slag, then that's like that's kind of on them. Like you you pre-established what would happen. Now, of course, if it's something where it's like you know the demon is in the mine shaft, the players go do something else, and then you say, well, the world blows up because there's a demon in the mine shaft, guys. Fuck, lol, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> like maybe maybe the problem there is that you're not. Um, what is it? You're not showing signs of an encroaching threat well enough. Like there are ways for you to represent to players the in the intensity of the situations that you're describing. Like um, Dungeon World and and does Apocalypse World have these tenets as well, where it's like show signs of an approaching threat. Mm. Um, yeah, they're they're very. You're different. supposed to you're supposed to broadcast what's coming up. Well, it's the it's the and this this is something that it's been interesting being really tuned into the development of the um, uh, the Apocalypse engine and how it's like evolved over time, but like. The um, the idea of the soft move hard move thing is very much becoming a um, uh, uh, like a mechanic of those games where you mm. make a series of soft moves and then if the players still haven't dealt with the problem you make a hard move. Yep. And this can, this can be as simple as like you see an ogre soft move the ogre is coming towards you soft move the ogre is pulling out his club soft move the ogre is swinging it at you okay fine fuck you two d twelve damage. Yep, like that's you actually make so. Make those moves as you go. This was really interesting because, like, we ran into this in Dungeon World and R and D when my players first encountered a gelatinous cube. Yeah. Because there was sort of this uh, this lack of comprehension on their side as role players of what the soft moves I was making was telling them. So it was like, okay, uh, you see sort of a glimmer in midair. Uh, you're not entirely sure what it is. Okay, they investigate, they step closer. Okay, you see like a, a wall of gelatin sort of like suspending a, a, a cloud of debris in midair. What do you do? Nothing. Okay, the gelatin sort of moves towards you. What do you do? Nothing. Okay, well, Lady Amsel, the gelatin hits you for, oh, geez, <laughs> you're dead. <laughs> Well, and I think that the the idea of soft and hard moves can be just like a lot of the stuff in Apocalypse World ported to other games. Like I do, I do soft and hard moves in um, uh, Swan Song all the time, yeah. right? Where I'm like, okay, so you hear about this guy, Constantine Fang, he's a big badass, and then you guys are like, okay, cool, no problem, we're the best, we can take this dude. Okay, cool. Somebody else, Wu, is like, oh shit, stay away from that guy, he's a badass. And you're like, yeah, no problem. And then when you finally meet him, I'm like, yeah, he vaporizes some dude, and everyone's like, what? <laughs> I don't understand. Where did this guy come from? Uh, my my favorite <laughs> personal encounter with soft and hard moves from Swan Song is when Feng was holding his gun on the small of my back, and I was like, should I just try to grab it from him? Like, I could really just do that. And then I was like, nope. Adam nope. wrote the book on what's happening right here, right now. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go along with this. Well, and it's it's that's that's the point when your characters and what. So okay, here's a here's a perfect example. This is gonna go back to what we were talking about. What you did there, whether you're doing it consciously or not, was you examined your fictional positioning for whether or not you'd be in a position to to turn things around. So Fang had the fictional positioning on you, right? Where he was like, he's got a gun pointed at your back. If you move, it's way faster for him to pull the trigger. And you're like, okay, it doesn't matter how good my rolls are. I don't have the fictional position to win this. So you waited yeah. until you had a better fictional position. And managed, you notice you managed to get out of the situation without having to make a roll. Yep. No, interesting. Because you turn the fictional positioning around. It's it's actually uh, like that is a different mindset. Like if I were playing oh, yeah. if I were playing Swan Song run by a different game master, I probably would have approached that situation differently. Well, I would have looked, yeah. looked at my table and been like, well, you know, I'm pretty good at fighting. I'm pretty good at shooting. I'm pretty good at these things. I should use one of those things that I'm pretty good at. But because I know you, Adam, because I know like the games that you like and the games that I like, I sort of knew like, okay, if I try to do something about it. Probably I'm just in a really bad spot. I'm I'm at a real disadvantage. I need to find a different way of dealing with it. Yeah. So that's there's a, there's an example of of how that works of fictional positioning and making choices based on how your character is positioned in the fiction rather than just looking at your character sheet. Yeah. Do we want to talk about like uh, this this secondary first question here from Red Virus Z? Is fictional positioning, yeah, is fictional positioning a thing that a system should be assigning, or is it up to the GM to properly inspire it because we're on the topic already? What do you think? It's a hard question because yeah, it's, it's a new. It's kind of I feel it's not a new discipline, but it's a thing that I I haven't really seen happen until 
fairly recently, like in the last couple of years. And I think that you're going to see more small press games taking fictional positioning really seriously. You want a great example of this. Blades in the Dark does it brilliantly. Like I've said that, that reading Blades has given me impetus to think about what I would include in a second edition of Dungeon World in terms of explaining flat out, like, this is what fictional positioning does. This is how it can trigger moves or how it might not. So some games are going to be about that, partly just because it's a new thing and we want to have it in, in the canon of games. But I also think that examining fictional positioning is, like we were just talking about, everybody's responsibility, right? And, I mean, you, you see it all the time where, like, Jeff does it too, where he's like, hold on, in the, the shared narrative yep. space we've just described, why do I have to do this? This doesn't make sense because you just said this would happen. And a lot of people are like, oh, that's rules lawyer. Yes. Like, this it's, is so it's, good. Because people are positioning. People shit on Jeff so awesome for so often for rules lawyering, for being like, no, wait, I snuck up on him and like I had it's, my gun out. I had it at the back of his head. Like, come on. And he like really fights for it really hard. And it's not actually rules lawyering. It's not actually metagaming. It's expecting the fiction to behave the way that it, it would. Right. right? It's, it's totally great. It's awesome. Yeah. It's good. It's good role playing because it's buying into the fiction as we've established it. And what can come across as being difficult is actually often just saying, hold on. Let's let's take your idea of the universe and my idea of the universe and make sure that they line up correctly because I have an idea of what this scene is like and you might have a different one and let's talk about that because often the GM will just be like yeah these things happen and let's let's move on but it's it's not about uh, trying to get what you want necessarily it's about understanding the fiction that you're all discussing together which is why I don't try to bust people's balls about that it's it's really cool yeah and like. Okay. Different games support that differently, right? Like it's a lot easier to allow that and to to embrace that in a, an apocalypse or a powered by the apocalypse game. Well, you, um, you know why you know why it looks like rules lawyering is because the games that that comes up in are mechanics first. Yep. You can't lawyer the fiction in a game that relies on the dice to be the 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 push, the thing that creates the fiction. So if you wanna if you want the fiction to turn out the way you want, yeah, you gotta be like, well, hold on, shouldn't I get a plus two to hit this guy? It's not, mm -hmm. shouldn't I not be bother rolling? Like, is isn't shouldn't it I just blow his brains out because I pulled the trigger next? Yeah, to his skull? You, you have to use you have to use the tools you have uh, at hand. Yeah, I like man. There's so much great stuff where like. If fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, I've got the player's handbook right here because I was making someone's new character to with them today. Like, okay, the <laughs> unconscious condition. We're getting a little bit sidetracked. It's so good. This is such a perfect example of exactly what we're talking about. Conditions. Um, incapacitated, grappled, threatened, petrified, unconscious. An unconscious creature is incapacitated, which is a condition which says they can't take actions or reactions. Um, they can't move or speak. They're unaware of their surroundings. Cool. The creature drops whatever it's holding and falls prone. Cool. The creature automatically fails strength and dexterity saving throws. Okay, cool. But like, no why would shit. you even make them? <laughs> here's a good thing. Here's, here's the great part. Attack rolls against the creature have advantage. Any attack that hits the creature is a critical hit if the attacker is within five feet of the creature. So the situation that you run up on is you've just knocked a creature with like a bazillion hit points unconscious. You want to kill them. You want to chop off their head. You walk up to them. You raise your axe. You bring it down hard on their neck. You roll an attack roll with advantage. You deal a critical hit. But they're not necessarily if, dead, if, right? If you like, if you even hit, like yes, I raise my I raise my sword over my hated foe's head. He's unconscious because I cast a sleep spell on him. I bring it down and hit a rock. Yeah, this what is what kind of jackass am I? It's a perfect example of how like fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons explicitly in its rules yeah, does out. not support fictional positioning. Right, and, and this is where it can be a problem where, like, it would have been totally fine for you to justify to me, and I, I would not have a fucking leg to stand on, to be like, okay, uh, well, I drag the peasant woman out to the stream and find a suitable rock upon which to sacrifice her, and for you to be like, okay, roll initiative against the peasant woman, so this is going to yep. be a whole fucking thing. Yep. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think that 
to go back to the question, whose responsibility is fictional positioning? I think it's everybody's, and that includes players, GMs, and game designers. To think about what you're doing is you're creating a set of rules to um, facilitate play. And if you're facilitating a specific kind of play, that's the kind of game that's going to happen. And there's going to be places where it butts heads with the things people expect. People expect to shoot an unconscious person and have them die, not have them unconsciously roll out of the way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's it's both. And I, I think that as you get more and more skill and practice as a GM and a player, you're going to see situations in which the rules combat you on that. And that's where live rule hacking comes into play, where you're like, you know what? The rule says this is how it works, but we're adult human beings ostensibly, and we don't like this rule, so let's change it. Let's change yep. it together. Yep. You just, you you kill him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a couple questions about games, but we're a little bit over time. So really quick, I think one of the greatest games that does fictional positioning really well is Apocalypse World. Uh, it has technology that's like relatively brand new in the role playing game scene. Play it, read it, run it. Just like get everything you can from it, wring it dry and use everything it taught you in every other game you ran and you will be a better GM for it. It's awesome. Agreed. Um, shout outs time. Adam, you want to take us away with some shout outs? Because uh, yes. this is the first being everything else we've had where shout outs are more important for you. Yeah, seriously, I'm so busy now. So if you have enjoyed listening to me talk shit, uh, you can do more of that in text form on Twitter uh, at Skinny Ghost. You can see all of this stuff in practice in a game I co wrote, uh, Dungeon World. And I'm streaming. Uh, video games uh, and and tabletop talk and all kinds of that stuff uh, right here at uh, twitch.tv slash Adam Coble. So you can check me out there. Um, and basically, I talk about role-playing games like crazy. Even if I'm playing Heroes of the Storm, I'm talking about role-playing games. So come check that out. Uh, I have a fantastic community of other nerds that you can uh, you can come in, and engage with. And uh, I do GMing uh, here. I play uh, Stars Without Number. I'm the GM for Swan Song, which is uh, getting to be maybe one of my favorite games I've ever played in my whole life. I really love Swan Song. And uh, Mirror Shades, which is also extremely awesome. We're playing Shadowrun. And uh, I've just started up uh, over at uh, Roll20 as their uh, GM in residence. And I will be playing Apocalypse World starting next Thursday at 11 a.m. And you can uh, you can find that over at uh, Roll20 app. Nice. Right here on Twitch. All right. And uh, if you're interested in what I'm doing on the internet, then you can find me at Twitter.com slash Silent Osiris with an O is a zero because the guy with the O being an O is someone else. And uh, Twitch.tv slash Silent Osiris. I've started streaming Titan Souls. I'm going to see if I can do a stream of that tomorrow morning. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm working towards streaming some other stuff on a more regular basis. So definitely come over there. Give me a follow. YouTube.com. I'm the lead level designer on a Warhammer 40,000 MMORPG called Eternal Crusade. So you should totally check that out. And... I do a bunch of stuff on JP's channel. So Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, we've got West Marches with Dr. Grigori coming back to us again. Um, uh, we're doing a new season of R&D coming up soon, so I can't wait to kick that off. Uh, we don't have a date yet set for that to start, but we're working as hard as we can to get that. I will, and of course, I, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a jerk to yeah. everybody in the audience. I know what game they're playing, and yeah. I'm so fucking excited. I like, know what game we're playing, and I'm oh super Oh, my stoked. God. So you, you definitely need to to tune in for that when it gets started. Keep an we're eye doing, on Steven for that. We're doing a fun thing with that game. Oh, like, there's actually so there's a high concept behind the way the game is going to work. I can't wait. Um, and I'm in Swan Song as well, so you should be sure to follow twitch.tv slash itmejp right where you are right now so that you can see all of the awesome content that Adam and I are both part of. So that's all for tonight. I uh, hope you all have a wonderful evening and have enjoyed us talking talking shit about role-playing games. Heard. Good night, everybody. Later, everybody.